Imagine we're on the road, on a highway, just cruising in a car, pretty relaxed. But then something unexpected happens. For the perception system, there are classic scenarios that are difficult. 200 meters in front of you, something flat is lying on the road, a shipping pallet. Are you able to recognize the danger in time? So for example, there's this EU pallet scenario in a highway example, which is where you're trying to detect a pallet that might have fallen off the back of a truck. And you have to be able to detect that out at you know, 200 meter plus distance at highway speeds. And then are you able to act accordingly? It's challenging for a human driver and it's challenging for driverless cars as well. Which is probably why so far there are not too many of those on the road. Engineering teams at Bosch are hard at work solving these challenges. They build special sensors and special simulation environments for safe, automated cars. Bosch associates like Ben Peters, who we were listening to just yet. That's coming up. Dear listeners, welcome to the show. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Shuko, how much automation is in your car? So I have uh, a radar and I have quite a lot of features like automatic emergency braking and I have quite a few sensors as well. So one of the things, because I used to work in this environment, the one thing that I always do is always book any kind of driver's assistance package that I can, because I think it's something really fascinating. And I also want to support the area that we're researching into. So yeah, I, I've got the whole package also with the parking and I also have the ACC in my vehicle, all of these things. What about you, Jeff? Well, one of my vehicles actually has quite a lot of, of that, um, even going so far as autopilot, which oh, wow. is, I mean, it truly is like magic. Uh, and for sure, it is nowhere near something which you would call driverless. Okay, but now, so you said you'll you'll order any package that you'll get. I'm too Schwabian now, and I actually kind of cut some corners. Uh, but one of the things that I think is is how much we take for granted on it. Um, my one car actually has a, I don't know, it's the lane keep mm-hmm. assist. Lane keep assist, yeah. And uh, I, sometimes I think I rely on that too much. <laughs> I've become very relaxed and comfortable in the driver's seat. And, you know, if I got behind the wheel of, of a, you know, call it a, a fully analog car, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a very different experience. It's hard to go back and to not have that type of driver assistance system in your vehicle. At least that's my experience. My next car, I couldn't imagine buying one without it. That's the voice of Kai Stepper. He's one of the people responsible for automated driving at Bosch. His favorite driver assistant? The traffic jam assistant that helps keep him the distance to the vehicle in front of him. That's exactly the one I wanted to mention. (laughs) But he wants more. I always enjoyed driving when I was younger, but I must say over the years when I drive long distances, I would happily, happily give up the driving task. If I could have a level four automated vehicle today, I would sign up for it immediately. But Kai and his team at Bosch, and frankly, any company in this space, have a long road ahead of them until that becomes a reality. So level four, as Kai mentioned, is what he wants. But this summer, the first level three vehicles have been released. That's right. And we're just at the beginning of level three, and it will take us a while to play that through until we unlock level four. But perhaps you're wondering, what are those levels in the first place? I think this is great, and it's definitely worth explaining. So the short version is, there are six levels of automation defined by the SAE International, which is a standardization body. It starts at level zero. Zero automation, all the tasks are in the human's hand. Think of it as a piano that you play manually. And as it goes up to level five, full automation, the human doesn't have anything to do. Think of it as music that is played by a computer. (laughs) There's a a subtle difference uh, between the two levels, and Kai will help us understand the different levels better. So we're going to start with... Level zero, which doesn't have any automation per se. But there are still some things that the car can help you with. So, for example, a forward collision warning functionality or automatic emergency braking. 
is truly a driver assistance function, but it's still a level zero functionality. Got it. What's next? So a very good example for a level one system is adaptive cruise control. So the vehicle accelerates, decelerates in an automated fashion, but it stays in that very narrow segment of longitudinal control. Or lateral control, actually. So lane keep assist is also level one. But they're not combined. The longitudinal control and the lateral control act independently of each other. That changes with level two. The driver still needs to be very much engaged with hands on the steering wheel, eyes on the road, the mind, you know, fully focused on the driving task, but we're combining longitudinal and lateral control. That would be something like highway assist or traffic jam assist, Kai's favorite assistant function, which Bosch calls Bosch driving assist. Okay, so level three? Nope. Level two has still a little more to offer. Actually, an exciting bonus level. Level two hands-free is really an interesting variation of level two. We would allow hands-off, but still eyes on, mind on, to be fully engaged and, you know, be ready to take over and being responsible for the driving task, period. Okay, so now at this point, as we advance through the levels, going back to our piano analogy, we're hearing additional depth to the sound and the music. And now comes really an interesting step when you go to level three. Because level three means, in certain situations, the human can pass responsibility completely to the car. And that's really a disruptive step. In this situation, you can take your feet, your hands, and your mind off the task of driving. And typical examples of that are highway pilot, and you can already um, sense that in the name, right? We're going from highway assist to a pilot function, meaning, okay, now we really have the machine as the pilot. It's important to remember, however, that the car knows its limitations. And when it foresees a situation that it can't handle on its own, it gives the driver a warning that they'll have to take over within 10 to 15 seconds. So you definitely need to be somewhat alert and ready to jump in. And that is because level three's pilot function, like the Bosch driving pilot, work only in specific environments, highway driving, for instance. But there's still two more levels to go. On to level four. And here, the system is automated. No driver needed at all. But the systems are built for specific environments, or what the engineers call operational design domains. For example, with trucks, mining operations, things that are on private property, they're not in the public space. And there you have driverless vehicles, boarding rocks, transporting different materials. That is already deployed and running for quite a number of years. So there, automated driving is a reality already. In these trucks, there is no driver anymore that could act as a fallback. The system is completely on its own. During the specific scenario it is built for, the system has the responsibility for the driving task. But of course, at the end of the day, we want to be on public roads, we want to put this in, in people's hands, we want to support fleet operations, etc. Which finally brings us to level five. There's no even a need for a driver's seat anymore or a steering wheel or pedals because the system is capable of handling all traffic situations in many, many places around the world without human intervention or without human assistance. And that is still quite far away. And I think the really interesting question is, how do we get there? How can Bosch developers get us there? At Bosch, we're actually at this very interesting threshold. We're right in the middle of this progression from level zero to level five. We're at two and a half, making the step to level three. And that is a huge step. But for the technical implementation, it has dramatic consequences. And that's because the car can't fully count on the human as a fallback anymore. When we're using these pilot functionalities, we can watch a movie or read a book while the car is doing the driving. I think also a lot of people will be staring at their phones. Yes, there's also that. Uh, but the point is we're not following what's going on in the highway. 
And so if something goes wrong or something breaks with the car, mm. we can't immediately take over control. The systems of the car need to work at all times. Beating, braking, steering, the availability of the power grid, the network communication, the computer, the sensors. All of these need to have a very, very, very high level of availability so that indeed the machine can take over and be the fallback solution as well. Mm. A fallback system that takes over when the main system has a failure. So instead of one braking system, build in two. Build in two power grids and double the number of sensors as well. You could take that approach, but that would be very cost prohibitive. Redundancy doesn't necessarily mean you have to have everything twice. Redundancy means that the machine, the system needs to be able to bring the vehicle into a safe state. That makes sense. So let's say the battery has a failure. Then the car can still drive on a smaller backup battery until it can safely stop somewhere. The secondary system doesn't necessarily need to have the same performance as the primary system as long as you're able to minimize risk. And this brings us to a major architectural change. If you look under the hood, quote unquote, of an automated car, it will look very different from how cars are being built today. And of course, that is the case even more with higher levels of automation. Compared to level three, level four will be a whole new challenge. To the point where some people doubt whether it will be possible to go an evolutionary path from level two to level three to level four, or if you need entirely new approaches. So now let's have a look into the future. I'm personally of the opinion that you cannot do it evolutionary. This is Axel Schwarz. While there are still many challenges with level three, he already works on level four technology. What we are working for is actually a vehicle which is intended to be without a driver at the first place. It's a very different challenge. So we're talking about vehicles that don't even have a steering wheel anymore or an accelerator pedal. Almost everything is handled by the technology alone. What Axel and his team focus on are sensors. They develop a new generation of sensors, specifically for level four cars. Those sensors are for radar, LIDAR, which is similar to radar, but using lasers instead of radio waves. And also optical cameras, as well as ultrasounds. But Axel says they can probably work with sensors. On the other hand, radar and LIDAR, they need new and vastly improved capabilities for level four. Tell us why they need this performance boost. So part of it is the redundancy that we discussed before. The idea is that one type of sensor can replace another type of sensor if needed. You could imagine a car driving into a dark tunnel and the camera sensor suddenly being blind. Then you have to uh, basically have a backup for that. And we want to avoid having to build in another camera, like a low light camera that is useless most of the time when the primary camera is working fine. So instead, the fallback is a different sensor. A different sensor, like a radar sensor or a LiDAR sensor. Radar and LiDAR, however, can't see colors. And they produce point clouds, not images. We've discussed the point cloud concept in previous episodes. True. But can they still fulfill the functionality, though? You'll have to consider the capabilities and the limitations of each sensor. We would ask what the sensor is supposed to be able to do. KPIs like range, how far can the sensor look at? So what's about the resolution? Can you distinguish two different items? Which also goes into what we call separability. So can you separate two different items? And we have then one sensor being able to do that. And now we're looking for a second sensor to be able to do that. Because our approach is that we always look for at least two sensors being able to handle a situation. This is similar to today, how we already build sensors into cars which complement each other. We use a camera and a radar and a LIDAR because each of them has capabilities that the other one does not. But you get different information from them. Today, with the need for redundancy, there needs to be much more overlap in these capabilities. The LIDAR might be reaching into the camera's turf, and the radar might be reaching into the camera's turf as well, so that depending on the situation, one or the other can effectively replace the camera if need be. So effectively, they work as a team. Making that happen is one challenge when it comes to sensors for level four. 
This is one of the most important and consistent stories that we've had on this show. How previously more or less separated domains within Bosch are now coming together mm -hmm. to create functionalities that before did not exist. And you notice that this happens in the physical architectures mm -hmm. and now increasingly in the digital architectures as well. Yeah. Kai, who we heard from earlier, likes to think of what an automated car does as a three-step process. Sense, think, act. Sense, think, act. Again, just so we can ponder this for a moment. Sense, think, act. We covered the sense part with Axel. Now for the think part. What does the car do with all this input from the sensors? It needs to interpret them and literally make sense of the data. It needs to understand its environment. This is only possible because we have computing power available, including the automated driving computer from Bosch. The sheer bandwidth and speed of performance that we can provide, we could only dream of a couple of years ago. I can actually speak from experience with this topic because the volume of data which comes off of these automobiles from all of these sensors actually jams up our networks. And so we had to create specific architectures on the IT side to handle all of this. So just throw computers at it, problem solved. No, of course that part is not that easy, but let's move on towards the ACT component because that needs computation as well. In any given moment, the car needs to compute what to do next. We have a very, very high number of possible options what to do next. Accelerate, decelerate, change the lane to the left, to the right, do a combination, all of that. Or do nothing, just keep going. And based on all these options, we now have to decide which option do we take. And this is happening an awful lot. 10 times per second, the system is making a decision about what to do. Or not to do. Also that, in addition to the sensor input, it has to take many more things into account. Where am I? Am I on a highway or am I in a city? Where do I wanna go next? How fast am I allowed to go? What would be the most comfortable action for the passengers? And so on. And then? And then translate that into commands for the braking system, the powertrain management, the steering system, and then execute that maneuver. But first and foremost, what the system needs to decide is, is this maneuver safe? And that is, of course, what the engineering is all about. Yes, make automated driving possible in the first place, but mostly make it safe. Right from the very get-go, we take into account the safety and security aspects of the development. So when we start with system requirements on a vehicle level, the safety requirements and security requirements are in there from day one. As Kai says himself, safety is in our DNA. I agree, but we've heard how complex these systems are, and we know how complex the world is. To nobody's surprise, actually guaranteeing that an automated car is safe is probably the biggest challenge of all. This topic is called validation, and it's practically the last and final step of engineering any product. It's where you prove that the product is fulfilling its purpose and is ready to be released. That sums it up well. Axel makes an example of a validation process from a few years ago. We validated, for example, automated emergency braking system. That's a system that steps on the brake on behalf of the driver if, for instance, suddenly there's a pedestrian in front of the car. What we did there is basically run the vehicle for, I don't know, 10,000 hours, having additional fleet validation for about 100,000 hours, making sure that there is no unwanted braking. No unwanted emergency braking in regular traffic was the most important part of the validation. Plus, they used some stage situations with dummies to show that the system does brake when it is supposed to do so. Now look into a level four system. It has like tons of more function than just braking. It's accelerating, it's doing a left turn, it's even reversing. And this is what we can't validate in this kind of old fashion anymore. If you would want to validate that in just by driving, you come up to tremendous numbers of kilometers you have to go, potentially like 10 or 100 billion kilometers to get that running. You can't validate just by driving. 
The problem is, with all the different situations an automated driverless car would need to encounter in the world, it has to handle them all perfectly. And it would take forever until you've trained a sufficient amount of them. Exactly. And it's impossible. Except simulation. That's how it's done. <laughs> this is a key part to a validation strategy, because then you can simulate situations which you probably did not meet in real life driving and you were not able even to stage in a physical um, or in a test drive scenario. Just like we can experience things in virtual reality that we rarely experience in real life, so can cars. If you've ever been to some of the more advanced virtual reality experiences in some places, you can actually walk through an environment that has actual physical changes that you see in virtual reality and you can feel in real life. So for automated cars, the way to prove that they're safe follows a very simple principle. You drive the cars for millions of kilometers, and if nothing happens, they're safe. It's easy for us to, much easier for us to drive a million miles in simulation than it is for us to drive a million miles in the physical world. And Ben Peters builds those simulations. He has been doing that with his startup called Five, which has recently been acquired by Bosch. So we try to build highly accurate models of the world that then we can explore in simulation. Not only can you drive endlessly in simulation, you can also learn from failures. But also, it's obviously acceptable for us to have safety events, have crashes in simulation, whereas it really isn't acceptable for us to do that in the real world. Shuko, can you please tell us exactly what Ben is simulating? So his team builds a few different models. One of them that I find quite interesting is focused on good driving. In real world test drives, that function is fulfilled by a human a safety driver. And then you have a safety driver in the vehicle that's responsible for intervening when the software is doing something that it shouldn't. We will see when the vehicle will not perform correctly, when the safety driver will interact with the vehicle, making sure that the driver is still safe. And then we will get the data returned to us and we will take that recorded data actually and have again a look at the sensor and see how we can improve that. And Obviously, when you move into a world of doing much more of your driving in simulation, you don't have that human in the loop anymore. And so you have to be able to build some form of model that is able to evaluate these millions of miles of simulation effectively. So a virtual safety driver that has a sense for what's good driving. That's right. A virtual safety driver or your virtual partner in the passenger seat. Can't tell you how many relationships will be saved by this <laughs> self-driving car. Stop looking at your phone. Why are you going this way? You're driving like my grandfather. Where was the exit? Where did you learn to drive? Why don't you go around that truck? Brake! 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 <laughs> I definitely have a few scenes in my head. Uh, for example, when I was taking my driver's license. And in France, you have the what we call conduite accompagné. So it's like... Uh, Assisted driving where you drive and your parents are sitting next to you and you can start mm -hmm. before the age of 18. Sure. Yes. No comment. And they're teary-eyed conversations with parents in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, no more arguing about driving styles. Um, and actually, that's a good point because you can argue about the question, what is good driving? There are some rules. And Ben's team, for example, consulted the UK Highway Code but there's a lot of ambiguity and wiggle room, a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Yeah, when's the appropriate time to give way to other drivers? How aggressive should one be entering a roundabout or pulling out at a junction? And how should that assertiveness change depending on the, the amount of traffic on the road? Eventually, Ben's team arrived at some conclusion and they phrased them as rules for the system. Hundreds and hundreds of rules written in computer code. We've created a domain-specific language. So this is a language that's human interpretable, but actually can be executed as an evaluation against the stack. When Ben says stack, he's speaking about the software components which are controlling the car. Exactly. And these can be seen as, they are the same thing as requirements for the stack, but they're deliberately different. Um, they're deliberately written by a separate team. And that's a good practice. One team defines what the software should do and develops it, and the other team defines what good behavior is and checks if the software follows that. And while this might sound incredibly technical, almost technocratic, you know, um, one software controls another software in a virtual simulation environment. 
Ben says that this approach can actually help the automated cars to behave more natural, more like you'd expect a human driver to behave. So we can evaluate the way in which other people are driving. So we go out and we collect data from the road and we can apply those rules to how other people are actually driving, how human drivers are driving, and we can see whether or not they tend to follow the rules, um, which often they don't. And then we can choose whether or not we adapt our rules so that we have a more humanistic behavior in our stack. Some of the human behavior might be codified to make the system more human, which is also a safety feature, because the car should behave in a way that is predictable for us. Other human behaviors will not be adopted by the system. In the end, the system, the automated driverless car, will always behave more cautiously than a human driver, take you know, fewer risks. Another model that Ben and his team build takes us back to what you know, Axel was talking about earlier, sensors. The sensors never have a perfect view of the world. Engineers can build the best sensors, but there's nothing they can do when there's another car or object blocking the sensor they have some limitations, then the algorithms that we build to interpret the data from the sensors and to build a semantic understanding of the world, these are imperfect as well. Which is similar to the human experience. Our perception is also imperfect. And that's why we have accidents. We make the wrong assessment of a situation. And this is the same for the automated drivers. These errors are then propagated to the planning system and then potentially to the control system as well. Um, so you can see how actually relatively small errors. So, for example, a small error in the estimation of the orientation of a vehicle can then lead to a really different prediction about whether or not that vehicle on a roundabout is going to stay on the roundabout or whether it's going to leave the roundabout, which could then potentially lead to the incorrect decision about whether the the, um, ego vehicle, our vehicle, should pull out onto the roundabout or not. Which is a, a cascade, effectively, and it's very difficult to stop. Definitely. So best to stop at the beginning. Make the sensors better. That's Axel's job. But also make the interpretation of the sensor data, make the software better. That's where Ben's simulation can help. Where we actually build a surrogate model of a perception system's error statistics in the real world. So you take a perception system, you operate it in the real world, you then create a ground truth for what that perception system has seen in the real world, a ground truth being this is what actually happened, and then you have the output from the perception systems, which is this is what we think happened, and then the difference between the two is the error, and you build that over a very, very large data set and fit a model to it, and that model then represents the error statistics of the perception system, and then you can sample from that model in simulation, so you're sampling from the statistics of the the real perception system simulation. Shuko, could you bring that around for us again? So in simple terms, it means that Ben wants to make sure that the simulation is not a perfect world. Instead, he wants the simulation to be as close to the real world as possible. And that includes simulating the errors of the perception system as closely as possible too. This comes back to the sense, think, and act paradigm. You need imperfections in the model to sense so that when you simulate the millions of miles you're driving through in a virtual world, the situations where your virtual safety driver complains are actually realistic. Exactly. And that way, simulations can fulfill two purposes. During development, they can reveal bugs and errors quite quickly, and they help find the root cause of these bugs so that it can be fixed. And then we can see, because Ben is using, obviously, the physical description of the sensor in the end, we can see if the sensor, how it's actually physically described, is sufficient to meet the needs of the vehicle. And this, again, would then be returned to my teams and say, okay, it's not sufficient what the sensor is able to do. You need to improve it. So simulations accelerate the development. And then when the development is done and the actual car is supposed to go on an actual road, simulations can help prove that it is safe to do so. When is it safe then to deploy automated vehicles? That's still up for debate. Just to clarify a little bit on the importance of the simulations, we've talked in previous episodes about how important it is for AI to have realistic training data so that the results are also realistic. This is why it is so important that we have this around, and this is why the acquisition of five is such a huge improvement for Bosch overall. This comes back to the debate. 
How do we know when they're safe and they don't cause accidents? Is that the only criteria? Not having accidents. Do you mean no accidents at all? Zero? Is it perfect? Or, you know, are we also talking about how many accidents could be allowed? This is a good question. This is, this is a, almost a societal question at this point because we have accidents currently. Mm. Are we now only accepting perfection from these systems? I, I'm not sure how to answer that, honestly. On the other hand, would be systems that drive just as good as human drivers. So that's probably also not really sufficient. Personally, I agree. We want the technology to be better than us. And to be frank, they will never be perfect. Sure. Axel found a great way to frame this. He tied it back to German automotive pioneer Bertha Benz. Just go back to Bertha Benz and imagine she would have needed to think of all this kind of regulations and things which could happen when she was driving her vehicle somewhere here close to Stuttgart, she probably would never have started. So it's always also a question about society taking a certain risk to allow these automatic vehicles to operate on the road in the end. I think all of our listeners can agree, without a certain level of risk, there would be no innovation. Now, when you take that risk, there's also a chance for things to go work better afterwards, which is ultimately our goal. And I personally think that chance is huge here. Because as we heard, everyone involved puts so much emphasis on safety as the primary dimension. And that includes Kai, who adds to the point that Axel just made. When we say invented for life, it of course focuses on the invention part and uh, the passion and uh, the joy of bringing new innovative products and processes to the market. But it's also about protecting life, improving life. And our history speaks for itself. So listeners, if you expected robo-taxis to be available this year, be patient. They will come, but we want them to be safe. Kai and Axa and Ben and their teams are hard at work to make self-driving vehicles a reality. And maybe we have some listeners who would like to support directly. We are not stopping on the wealth of knowledge and experience we have in this company. As a matter of fact, we want to continue to grow it. So we are hiring. We are hiring in the spaces of automated driving and advanced driver assistance systems. If you have any interest, if you have friends, colleagues, family members that are interested in a challenge and work on fascinating products, have them come talk to the automated driving team at Bosch. I love that we can have promotions like this on this show. It's really wonderful. And for sure, once we have really automated driving, that won't only make the roads safer. They can also help mitigate issues like pollution and even congestion. So while you wait for the driverless future, enjoy some time in a level 3 vehicle. I definitely can't wait to get more and more automation into our cars. And what's great about that, more automation already can increase safety and efficiency of cars. And what's probably on top of a car buyer's mind, automation contributes to comfort. You mean top comfort levels, of mm -hmm. course, will be reached with automated cars. I mean, just imagine, Jeff, you and I cruising on the highway, letting the car do its thing, do the driving. We discussed earlier how we could use the time that we won, but now I know what we could do. Recording our next episode of the show, of course. It's true that the interiors of cars make for a great impromptu recording studio, <laughs> as every podcast knows. As you would know. <laughs> of course. We could even have our interviewees join us. Maybe that's our future indeed. Could definitely be fun. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Next month on the show, more automations, robots. Really looking forward to it. Until then, we'll see you later. See you later.